Welcome. You have entered the realm of 1111 Talk Radio. Your host is Simron. It's time to discover your own language with the universe. Empower yourself. Broaden your mind. Open your heart and discover who you are. Now, here's your host, Simron. Welcome. I'm so excited to be with you today, and I hope that your morning, afternoon, or evening is going very well. I want you to take a moment while you listen to this show and sit back and be tender with yourself. Tender is not often a word that we think about or hear about a lot, but it's something that we must learn to cultivate within ourselves. You can very often hear about the word self care or self love. And those two words have a gamut of meanings depending on who you speak to. And often they get tossed aside and picked back up. But tenderness is something that we all must embrace at this time. And it goes far beyond self-love or self-care. It embraces intimacy at a level that perhaps you've not allowed yourself to go. And it also asks vulnerability of you in a way that you learn to be soft with yourself. I think that much of my own life has been on this quest as a woman to find my feminine softness and to continue to soften into my nature and my naturalness. But tenderness is a different kind of softness. It leans more into the divine sense of love and self-care, of gentleness, of real seeing. And there's almost no end to the degree of tenderness that we can place upon ourselves and then be able to see, hear, and acknowledge others with. Tenderness is actually something quite radical. And I'm hoping that this conversation will have you start thinking about it more and more. The name of the book that we're talking about today is Radical Self Tenderness How Nurturing Your Soul Can Help Heal the World. And it is a truly intimate and beautiful book by Christy Hardwick. Within it, she is really been the example of that level of intimacy and vulnerability, of the inquiry, of the tenderness, in layering degrees, deepening into herself, and at the same time, pulling the threads within your own heart so that you start to look at being more intimate, vulnerable, and tender. Christy has spent more than 30 years developing leaders and managing change. While in the high-tech sector, she simultaneously held leadership positions at work and in the community. She is an American Leadership Forum Senior Fellow and Faculty Member, and for five years she served on the Women's Leadership Board at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. She was the founding board chair of GreatSchools.net, served two terms as an elected school trustee, and also chaired the board for GLSEN the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network. She is an expert facilitator of contextual leadership with the Institute of Women's Leadership and the American Leadership Forum, Silicon Valley. Today, we're talking about radical self-tenderness. Welcome, Christy, to 1111 Talk Radio. Thank you. Well, thank you for that beautiful introduction to this subject. I was just mesmerized listening to you speak about it. I could listen to you all day, but I guess we will have a conversation. So I'm happy to be here. Well, I spoke about it based on the energies and the feelings that I received in reading your book. And you took story to a completely different level than oftentimes we can take story with. I think it's really easy to utilize story as this thing that we carry on our backs or um, for the purposes of doing something with it. But the entire time that I was reading your story and then stepping into the questions around tenderness, 
I could feel the innate deepening and softening that you were doing within yourself and sharing in such a vulnerable way. And I think that's where I'd like to start because the one thing about the book is it's very vulnerable. It's very intimate. And talk about how that had to be the opening doorway for you to even explore this topic, especially being someone that has come from a corporate and leadership background that has been such a strong uh, civil rights and um, activist for all manner of causes and peoples, that those areas would seem to harden a person or make them put on a guard or a fight. And this book is very vulnerable and very intimate. So talk about that a little bit. Thank you. It is. Um, it was a challenge and it was something that came to me first quietly and sweetly. You need to write about tenderness. <laughs> and I would say that's interesting to myself, but I didn't do it and kept powering through and getting things done and checking things off my list. And then it continued to say those words to me, but then it shifted. And one day I woke up with the words, tenderness terrifies me. And that stopped me in my tracks. Mm. And I said to myself, what? Yes, tenderness terrifies me. And I had to listen to the words. I let them sink in. But I still tried to resist. Because just the idea that tenderness terrified me was such an intimate thought. And it just didn't fit with my narrative about myself at the time that anything would be terrifying to me. And something that sounded so innocuous, like tenderness. So I began to be curious about it and eventually stopped resisting and sat down and wrote. And I started with that line. Why would tenderness terrify me? And I began to have answers with the stories from my life. Stories of events and things that happened that I didn't really want to look at anymore. I felt like, you know, I'm over that. I've done it. I've done the work. I'm done. It's good. <laughs> and it wasn't done. There was still a dance I needed to do with some of the things that happened that I made meaning out of that made me guard and protect myself. And as you mentioned, choose things to do that would allow me to be in charge in front of room but not in my heart or in my body as much. So this book allowed me to explore something without editing myself, which I didn't do. I wrote the things that came up in answer to the question about what was terrifying for me about the vulnerability of tenderness. It very much felt like communion, communion of the heart and the soul. And you said something uh, just now about, well, I don't need to look at those things. I've already done this. And I think that that's probably a sentiment or a thought that many people have. And, and oftentimes many in the self-help, personal growth, spiritual fields, we can bypass or bamboozle ourselves by convincing ourselves that we really are complete and even use the stories that we have seemingly healed through to then go on and wear them as badges or banners or uh, teaching moments in a way that still avoids the real deep nuances of the experience. What did you find to be that fine line, that distinction that really helped you turn back and say, this is not about fighting for myself. This is not about the story and all that I overcame, but it really is about the witnessing, the, the romance, the deep understanding and, and fulfillment of, of knowing who I am in that way. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I started with what it wasn't, right? So I started with, okay, there's this question about tenderness and is it the same as self-care? So I explored that and said, okay, I'm pretty good at that, actually. You know, I'll, I'll do a spa day. I'll take care of myself. I'll rest. I'll stop. I do all those things. Okay, check. 
Is it about self-love? Well, I have things that I appreciate about myself. I can say that I love this being more than I did in the past. So I've made progress there. So check. And I kept going through the things that I thought it was about. I spend a lot of time with others and I help them to look at their own interior life and what they're saying to themselves and their self-talk and whether or not they're centered in their own values and those kind of things. I've been able to be helpful in that area. And I would even talk to people about and help them to have a greater sense of their own worth and their own value because I did learn how to do that enough to share myself in the ways that I do. But there was something more. There was this idea of tenderness, being tender with myself. There was a sweetness to it. There was a allowing. There was a not trying in it. There was a gentle, let myself feel love. I realized that I hadn't done what they call mirror work, right? You look at yourself and and say you love yourself. Because I didn't like to, to see myself. And when I did, what I was seeing was the stories I'd been telling myself. So some of the work began with just looking at me and recognizing that I did not have tender feelings towards myself. That's really powerful and uh, very, very deep work to even get to that place. I think that especially with so much that has happened in the world in the last, let's say, five years, much less whatever might have happened before and on into childhood, but so often we are very guarded and we keep those guards up where love is resisted or even compliments can be cast away as if they're not deserved, uh, even gratitude kind of pushed aside rather than letting it sink in and really touch the heart. So it's, it's very powerful that you got to that place of understanding that you dealt with those types of things in that way and that it occurred in your sixth decade because so often, at least as far as I'm concerned, it sometimes takes a while to get us there, to, to even get to the point where we realize that. How do you feel about that occurring in your sixth decade? And what was the richness that occurred because it was allowed to come during this time? Mm. You know, I think each of us grows at different paces at different times. And I certainly grew rapidly when it came to my career and success and all those kind of things. But what I put on the back burner was my own internal life. And so as I slowed down somewhat, <laughs> some of the accomplishing and getting things done, there was space. So I had to create the space for this to occur to me. It was in the silence and the quietness of an evening of going to sleep without a mind full of everyone else's issues and huge projects and so many things to do that I could have openness so that something could arise in my mind that I needed to hear. And so that space of the slowing down period was helpful. I encourage and I, I hope that others can find that space for themselves earlier so that you can have more joy and freedom earlier. But whatever time it comes, it's, it's a beautiful thing that I'm now deepening my relationship with myself. And I think about one of the stories I told in the book was about a time that I was singing to myself in the mirror, actually. I was singing, ain't I a cutie? Ain't I a cutie? And I was so happy. I was just singing in the mirror, this little girl smiling. I must have been about eight or nine years old. And my brother came into the room. And he smacked me upside the head, literally, and the term we use in our family, slapped you upside the head. And he said, don't be so conceited. Don't be singing to yourself like that. So that made me decide. I gave it meaning. It was a one-time incident. But that incident told me that loving yourself or loving on yourself or 
feeling good about yourself, not good. And I must have gotten that message reinforced in other ways as well, but it's the memory that came up when I think about how difficult it is to feel the joy of self, to feel the joy of being part of creation, to feel the joy of what I have to share in life. And that's what that little girl is feeling. But I put her away because she got in trouble for it. So instead, I began serious and getting things done and uh, never, ever felt like I was okay and it was okay to sing my own praises literally in any way. So even as I went through a career where I was very successful and people who worked with me would probably say, you know, some really wonderful things about me, but they bounced off of the shield of don't go there because you will be hurt or harmed if you do. That praise, that celebration, that seeing of oneself really is where we're all meant to be. That is the essence and the joy that you speak of that we are here to live out. But unfortunately, things do happen to all of us. And they send us into these places where we do get wounded. And I call the repetitions that build on top of that, I call them echoes, because we do tend to have these echoes of experience that keep hitting at that same wound. I often ask people, how much love can you stand? And that phrase to me is in parallel to you asking the question, am I terrified of my own tenderness? When we look at self-love and self-care, it does have a lot to do with mind, body, spirit. Talk a little bit about what tenderness means when it comes to mind, body, and soul. Well, I searched for it. And I used many different modalities searching for that connection with self. And at first, I was afraid of the connection with myself. I remember when I was doing some breath work with some breath work practitioners who were teaching me kind of the open mouth, circular breath without any pause. And it, that raises your energy level. And you actually feel your own life force just coursing through you. It's really beautiful. But the first few times I went through that, I was afraid of it. I literally uh, panicked when I was feeling the feelings. And the practitioner said, that's just your life force. It's okay. It's just your own life force. There's nothing happening here. You're okay. And that level of vibration of my own life was so uncomfortable because it was so unknown to me that I immediately left that session and ate food because food will you know, ground the body and, and settle it down. And I learned that. So I explored different modalities. I went to many different workshops. I learned to walk across fire. I walked across you know, 30 feet of hot coals to show myself what I could do with mind over matter. And you know, jumped from a big pole and landed and did every kind of extreme. And then you know, sometimes talk therapy, sometimes workshop therapy, everything to try to reach that place in me that I could touch. And when I would feel it, what would happen is that I would let myself fall into this sense of bliss and tenderness with life itself. And then when I would be sitting up, let's say from a meditation or leaving the workshop or whatever the thing was, I would say, but you can't live like that. I mean, if you live in a state of bliss in this world, You'll be too vulnerable. Something bad will happen to you. You can't walk around in love. So the idea that I had was, yes, it's there. I can find the tender places, but is it safe? Safety is a big issue when it comes to deepening into the type of intimacy and vulnerability that leads to self-tenderness, especially radical tenderness. And you spoke a, a bit about having to find safety again, both in your body as well as in relationships, in experience across the board, which I think is probably something that we all end up having to do is to find that safety internally within our container before we ever even really find it outside. And it doesn't mean that we necessarily feel fully safe outside at any point, but there's a strengthening that does take place internally. 
So when it comes to that safety and you really getting in your body and getting to know more of who you were, that led to a lot of changes in your life. And so often people become very, very afraid at the letting go, at the changes that have to come of what people will think uh, in regard to the changes that they make. How do you view those from the lens of tenderness? And how did you view them at the time you were making them? What was the bridge that had to be crossed? Mm -hmm. Well, I did make you know, many changes and transitions in my life. Um, I left um, two marriages and, and a relationship before finding one that I'm in today for 18 years that is beautiful for my life and my experience and my expression. But in making those decisions to, to leave, they were decisions based on some internalized fear that I would die if I didn't in some way. And it was extreme, but that's what it felt like at the time. I have to leave this. And I wasn't in being abused. It wasn't anything where it was actually life-threatening in that way. It was more internally, mentally, spiritually that I was harming myself by being in something that did not match my true self. So I had to flee. I literally fled, you know, two different marriages. And what's interesting is my internal knowingness was always present, but I just actually didn't listen to it. So outside of the church, both times I was being married, I was standing crying. And the first time my future mother-in-law came and said, what's wrong? Don't you want to marry my son? And of course, I wiped my tears and said, of course I do. I was 18 years old and went in and, and did that marriage that lasted just for a couple of years. And then I grew some as a, an adult into someone who is 28, 26, maybe 26 years old um, and did that again. And I was outside of church about to be married and tears were flowing and I was just stuck to the ground. And the minister who was to marry us came and said, you know, you don't have to do this. I can go in and tell people you do not have to go in there and do this. And I imagined my family and, and the wonderful man that was waiting for me and wiped my tears and went ahead in and had beautiful times with both those people. I don't regret that I married them. I do know that my soul was letting me know that this is not in alignment with the true expression of you. But I did not have the will or the understanding or the courage to listen then. I very After, much resonate with that because I, I had a very similar experience when it came to my arranged marriage. And it's interesting mm -hmm. how we don't pick up on those clues in the beginning. But it's also part of our innocence our naivete when we don't do that. And I've come to believe it's also part of our soul destiny that it was all part of the design anyway. I want you to continue mm -hmm. where you were going with the story, but also mm -hmm. looking back, do you think it was part of your design and your destiny? It, you know, I think so because uh, I am who I am because of everything I went through. All of those experiences, all of the questioning of self, all of the making decisions and, and feeling like it was not necessarily the right thing, but pushing through that. So I had to learn what that looks like. And at a certain point, um, I had to go to the depths of depression and that sense of life not having meaning in order for me to make a change. So the learning was, maybe you don't go that far next time. Maybe you don't have to get to the bottom of your bottom in order to make a different decision. Maybe begin to listen to the signs that come to you a little gentler. So that's part of being tender, is saying, I'll take the tenderness. I'll take a tender notice, a tender uh, tapping, a tender word, a tender feeling, uh, tears falling. Tears falling before my gut not, not feeling right. All those things could become a way of being more tender with myself by listening. And it's a courageous and still, you know, um, scares me <laughs> way of living because I don't know 
where things will go when I'm listening to that aspect of me that knows internally in my body that says, you need this. I just recently am am taking a month off from my coaching of leaders practice um, for the month of August because I got the feeling that I need a break and I need to integrate a lot that's happened in the last few months for me. That is a new level of tenderness that in the past I would have talked myself out of or maybe taken a week. But I listened and it's not urgency. I'm not sick. There's not something terrible happening. So I don't need to go there anymore. I don't need to go all the way to the breaking point in order to give myself some tender loving care. I can give myself tender loving care just with the notice that says, I feel this. I feel like I need this. So the growth from the time when I was the 18-year-old bride and the 26-year-old bride and um, the one who has three children now, twins, um, when I was eight, 19, and then uh, a son when I was um, 28. From that woman to this woman, I see all those things, the marriages, the children, everything happening perfectly for my highest good and hopefully not doing harm to those that are in my story with me. Your self-tenderness makes a difference to the whole world. Everything matters to the whole. If we are under the delusion that we are separate from all of life and therefore cannot affect or be affected by it, we're not paying attention. Christy Hardwick's hope is that this book and these words planted a seed for you to begin to nurture yourself. That in reading Radical Tenderness, that you look to where you are not tender in order to cultivate more tenderness there. She also knows that you can amplify places where you found that you can be tender with yourself and therefore tender with others. She wants you to make tenderness a default orientation. You can find out more about her on her Facebook page. Just find Christy Hardwick. And that's C-H-R-I-S-T-I-E, Hardwick. And if you're not on Facebook, then you can um, pick up the book at anywhere that books are sold and find out more about her there. Again, the title of the book is Radical Self-Tenderness, How Nurturing Your Soul Can Help Heal the World. We'll be right back with more of Christy's story and this beautiful book after these messages. Voice America is on LinkedIn. Connect with us today. Do you want more, more joy, more abundance, more power and presence? How would it feel to have more loving relationships, more empowered community, greater fulfillment and life purpose? The 1111 Mastermind Community inspires, empowers, guides and supports transformation. Shift your mind, expand your heart, deepen insights, let go and chart a new course, dream a new dream. The 1111 Mastermind Community is an online portal for personal transformation and soulful expansion. Go to courses.1111mag.com. That's courses.1111mag.com. Change begins with you. Let it be simple, convenient, and transformative. The time is now. Step through the 1111 Gateway. Courses.1111mag.com. Have you seen 1111? Do you wonder why certain numbers keep showing up in your life? 11, 111, 22, 33, 444. People all over the world are seeing 1111 and learning the language of universal communication. Subscribe to 1111 Magazine today, www.1111mag.com. 1111 Magazine is a bi-monthly print publication that offers a rich, multi-sensory experience. As you engage with experts and topics of consciousness, become enlightened, empowered, and energized so you live a passionate and authentic life of conscious choices. 1111 Magazine, a daily staple for lifting the mindset. 
Discovering the Heart and Stepping into Conscious Living. 1111 Magazine. Order now at www.1111mag.com. 1111mag.com. It's your world. Motivate. Change. Succeed. VoiceAmericaEmpowerment.com. You are listening to 1111 Talk Radio. Simron is an award-winning author, publisher of 1111 Magazine, powerful speaker of wisdom, and a life mentor. Find out more at IamSimron.com. Now, back to 1111 Talk Radio. Welcome back. My guest today is Christy Hardwick, and she has been a leader in many areas, a leader of corporate organizations, of educational organizations, and also community organizations. She's written a beautiful book called Radical Self-Tenderness, How Nurturing Your Soul Can Help Heal the World. And you can find her on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, just look up Christy Hardwick. Or if you want to contact her directly and find out other things she's involved in, you can go to inspirationgatherings.org. That's inspirationgatherings with an S. Dot org. You want to pick up this book and go ahead and read it because she's got another one coming out later this year and you'll want to have the foundation of this before you move into the next one. Christy says that this life is a grand experiment. You don't need to believe anything or anyone. You need to discover, discern, and decide for yourself. What if you approached your life like an experiment? She was experimenting with tenderness. She was looking for it, noticing it, documenting it, writing about it, welcoming it. She saw how it felt. She noticed what happened when she gave it. And she noticed what happens when she was willing to receive it. Christy was centering her attention on this phenomenon and watching it grow in her life. And now she invites you to do the same. Christy, in the book, there was a section where you were uh, going through some therapy, and there's a line in the book that is so powerful where you said, I felt superior and broken at the same time. And I think that that's something that we do from our wounding. We do develop this persona or this identity that we overcompensate for, and yet internally so often we can feel all of the brokenness, all of the shame, all of the inadequacy that resides there. When you were at that point then, were you aware that both of these things were in existence and kind of living them in that way? Or was this something that you came to as you delved more into the tenderness of your own story? Well, when I think about that time and that that particular line, I think about I was trying different modes of therapy and really, I would try to outsmart the therapist in whatever way I could to, to take control of the situation. I didn't want them to actually be able to go deep with me or for me to have to go deep with myself. So what I did instead was put up all kinds of ways to entrap them, in a sense, into my narrative that I wanted us to explore. So I really worked to make people fit the narrative that the world is hard. It's not safe. I I can't be here. I can't share because it's not safe. So I really participated in making spaces not safe for myself. And I did not know that's what I was doing. I just automatically tried to protect myself from any kind of vulnerability because I had, in my mind, made the law of my life that it wasn't safe to be vulnerable. And you also mentioned control, because I think that we all have these degrees of control where we we don't let go. Oftentimes it's unconscious. And if we really look, it, it is conscious. Like we know where we're not willing to bend or where we have to be in charge or we have to say something in a room. Talk a little bit about how you've worked with control when it comes to deepening into tenderness. Mm. 
it's a it's a daily practice and the work continues but i would say that what's happened as i've become more aware that there's something beautiful inside me that can't ever be harmed or touched by anything that's ever happened to me then i can let some of my defenses down and i can relax trying to control all the outer circumstances so that i can feel better i now know that inside me there's a place of safety there's a place of wholeness so i don't have to make sure that the world complies with what i need and i don't have to get it to comply and that includes every person even now with the way things are happening around us in the United States and throughout the world there are people whose ideas i disagree with people who i would prefer them to be more tender to exude what i consider more love but i can't control that but that not being able to control it doesn't make me feel helpless i can go inside and i can become someone who broadcast tenderness who broadcast love that i can do it doesn't matter what people outside me are doing i get to control that so the place i have shifted from is trying to control the outside world so that i can feel better and instead working on my own ability to allow myself to be fully authentic and to do the work to control myself from trying to change things external to me instead of myself what it makes me think of is you know there there's so many people driven by their woundings by their need to overcome their past that we act out kindness we act out love we act out the goodness that we want other people to perceive but it doesn't necessarily really exist it's the energy is not really there you have a section in your book where you talk about tenderness and kindness and you ask the question are they the same thing can we use that kindness as an example of how we can live by a mask of kindness and tenderness or we can ground into what true tenderness would be so that kindness is actually an embodied experience and expression as opposed to the mask of one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we can definitely be, be kind. We can be generous. We can be what looks like loving um, without ever actually visiting that inside of ourselves because we know what to do. So we know what the behavior looks like. We know what the actions look like. We know what the words sound like. We know what our posture should be. So we can practice all those things and we can act them. Being them is a completely different thing because it requires openness and vulnerability. So kindness coming from a place of fullness inside and being kind is something that's overflowing from me. It just happens organically because I feel this sense of fullness and this sense of connection. Acting kind is something that comes more from my mind rather than from my heart and it's i know this is the right thing to do here and there's nothing wrong with doing kind things to the best of your ability if that's what you've got if what you've got is the ability to act kind please act kind it's a matter of how much more we can give and even experience if we are being kind from the overflowing fullness and wholeness within ourselves it has more power in it I have found that when I've written books usually what I think I know is only the beginning that what I really learn comes after the book is written and I know that you've experienced the passing of a lot of individuals that meant a lot to you and it's it's been pretty close together pretty recent how has your exploration in tenderness had to deepen through that pros pos uh, process and in what ways did you allow that tenderness for yourself as well as the tenderness required for what was happening outside it's really about feeling and allowing myself to feel and not needing to get over it and get through it and figure out what to do 
I think it was, I, for about more than 10 years, I served on a board for the Center for Living with Dying. And the thing I learned from the people who dealt with death every day was how life affirming that can be to really recognize that at some point, this is a place we visit and will we'll be in our lives always. So when it came to people around me dying, I remembered the idea that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross said, and she said, don't just do something, sit there. Because we have this tendency to want to you know, fluff the pillows and do things and make food and do it. Sit with it, sit with the grief, sit with your feelings, let it deepen you, let it open your heart further. I feel like my heart has been opened further and has the capacity for more love because I allowed my grief to happen. And I'm allowing some time for it, you know, coming up in a week or so to take even more time to process it all. But I also was tender with myself about not having expectations about how I should be during the time, what I should need, how much I could help or not help. I did what I felt truly was authentically coming from a place of love. and. If I were the mother of someone who lost, you know, another parent, I would have a different role. I would have to power through my grief and deal with it. But in these particular circumstances, I was not a dependent of any of the people who died, just very close and dear friends. So I could allow myself to process the grief and then make myself um, capable of being of service. And now for one of the dear friends, I will facilitate the celebration of life. I felt into that. I didn't um, know immediately. And I let go of the fear that maybe I wouldn't be able to help if I didn't jump in immediately. I waited until I felt that sense of, okay, this feels right to me. I'm going to volunteer into this space and do this thing and now it feels completely in alignment there's no reaching stress you know tension um pressure it's an act of of love in this very fast-paced world where we are constantly running constantly achieving constantly acting tenderness seems to really require discernment and time, based on what you just said, allowing the time to really get to an understanding of not only feeling, but if, when, and how to act. Can you talk a little bit more about that discerning or how tenderness has allowed you to stretch time or be more embracing of allowing time? Mm -hmm. One of the things I noticed that I do now is I check in when I have an impulse because I realize that some of my impulses were built on experiences and meanings that might not be accurate now. They were based on even something I might have concluded when I was a child. They were based on something I might have concluded when I was in a traumatic situation. So now when I have an impulse to do or to move forward on something, I pause and check in. I even ask myself, who's speaking? Which part of me is speaking? The wound, the fearful one, or the one who feels grounded and full and ready to serve? So that time in itself, you don't have to be able to take a month off or a week off or even a day off. Even the pause between The impulse and your action can be sometimes enough to discern who in you, what part of you is speaking. As you move through writing Radical Self-Tenderness, it's filled with all manner of experiences that you've been through and how you looked at them. Do you feel something inside of you was seeking a sort of catharsis? type of experience through this or more of a witnessing? Were you at a place of 
neutrality around your experiences or did this allow you to kind of complete the healing and the wholeness required around them? And would you mm -hmm. recommend that people move through their own stories in the same manner? Mm -hmm. So I would have to say that it's not, um, it was cathartic, yes. Um, closure, no. Um, it was the beginning of a conversation I needed to have with myself. And a conversation that I was willing to share for the benefit of others. There were times when I was writing and when I had an editor reviewing what I wrote, and she would say, there's these three places here where I want you to go back in and write more. It feels like you were holding your breath when you wrote this. And she was absolutely right. When I went back to those places, I was holding my breath. I wrote, I didn't want to feel what I felt at the time. So I did have to go through and refeel in order to share with people the depth of my experience so that they could possibly relate to something in their life that felt like that. Didn't have to be the same thing. But for example, when I wrote about my son who I needed to send to residential therapy and leave him in a lockdown facility, and when that lock clicked and I dropped to my knees, I had to share that moment because it was something that I never forgot and it shaped me for a very long time. And it still, as you can see, brings up the emotion of the time. But I needed to feel that in order to recognize that I'm not there now. He's not there now. It's safe for me to be joyful and alive now because those things have happened but are not happening right now. So I would say, yes, do write you know, about your own journey. Feel the feelings that you may be tucked away, as they say in yoga, into a samskara, a little wound that you've tucked away someplace that's still just circulating inside you that every time something happens that's like it gets touched and your heart closes or you have a reaction so do the writing do the work do whatever's necessary to clear your heart of these things so that life as it is today can come through and the love that you are today can come through in that particular section, you use the word mistakes encapsulated in quotes. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to look back at our lives and call certain moments mistakes or really get into a place of judgment around different things. And I think it's part of what we're here in life to absolve ourselves of. How has tenderness allowed you to dissolve certain scenarios and experiences? from being mistakes into perhaps even being miracles? Mm. Well, that has been one of the really challenging aspects of this work. And there's a song by Ricky Byers that I sang many, many times to myself because it was helpful. No mistakes have been made in God. All the ways that we seem to fail in God all fade. It all fades into God. And mm -hmm. whether I believe in, you know, God or universe or source or substance, the idea was that the mistakes that I call mistakes fade when you transform them into learning and transform them into a greater expression of yourself. So they're not wasted. They're not something that just stands there as a solid stone that we call a mistake that's in our way. It's an obstacle in our path. It's something that can be transformed. So I continue to do the work to not see anything as, it doesn't mean I didn't make errors, but not see them as stone clad mistakes that can't be overcome. 
So we, I hold it differently now. I hold it as I did when Dr. Maya Angelou said, you did what you did when you knew what you knew, and when you knew better, you did better. And that was very true for me. Mm, beautifully spoken. I want to go back to you talking about holding your breath and having to deepen into the story. And I can feel on the planet the breath being held by people, by the collective, by things that maybe they're going through in their families, things going through socially, uh, nationally, globally. And how do we then use that tenderness to be tender with the world that we see? Everything I do now, everything I read, look at, I have my reaction to at a human level, whether it's the initial um, sadness, disgust, frustration, anger, joy, love, peace, whatever comes up. And then I turn toward myself and I ask, how can you hold this tenderly? And what's shifted and changed in me is that I don't have a war going on with me and the world, with me and anyone in the world. I work on showing up for the things that I want to see more of. And if something saddens me, I feel the sadness, but I don't spend my energy and time broadcasting all my sadness. I will say I've, I've been feeling sad. And I'll also say I've been feeling joy. But what I spend my time broadcasting is authenticity. What's actually happening now in this moment for me. And I think that if more people in the world were being their authentic selves, we wouldn't get to the level of conflict that we have because we would move through the moments of sadness, despair, frustration, disgust, whatever the feeling is that comes up and move through it onto the next moment and not get stuck there in a tug of war, in a tug of words. We would move through things with more grace and be reunited more often. So I think that being tender inside gives me the opportunity to be more love in terms of how I share and what I share and to not get caught up in othering or spending time fighting against something. It's not a judgment of people who fight. It's just not my work. I instead am broadcasting love, broadcasting joy, broadcasting tenderness and feeling my feelings of sadness, despair and moving through them to find love and joy and hope on the other side. And this question of radical self-tenderness, what is the new question that that has now led to? It is the question, which is the title of my new book that will come out, To What End? <laughs> hmm. So my next question is, to what end? All that we do, all that we are, all that we're being, to what end are we here? And is there an assignment that's greater than love? Wonderful words and wonderful wisdom from Christy Hardwick and a beautiful example. How wonderful could your life be if you continually notice where you are tender, giving it an inner smile, seeing where others are tender, and sharing it, creating rituals to acknowledge tenderness, amplifying tenderness, replicating it in as many areas of your life as you can find. What kind of experience could life become? What is made possible when you invite someone to be your co-conspirator and commit to building a reservoir of tenderness within and between you? To what kind of world would you be contributing? This is from Christy Hardwick's book, Radical Self-Tenderness, How Nurturing Your Soul Can Help Heal the World. I invite you to pick up your copy or listen to it on Audible. You can find out more about Christy Hardwick and connect with her on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, 
or going to inspirationgatherings.org. Thank you so much, Christy, for being on 1111 Talk Radio. Until next week, I am Simran, in love, of love, with love and as love. Be well. Thank you for opening your mind to a new reality, your heart to greater compassion, and your experience of aliveness with 1111 Talk Radio. Join host Simron next Tuesday at 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern Time to step through the gateway of conscious living here on the Voice America Empowerment Channel. Remember, you are not on the journey. You are the journey.